or life on this earth. It is a stewardship and a gift uh, we so easily take for granted. Uh, it is an opportunity for much reward that if we could but see and measure on this side of eternity, surely we would be far busier about planting, laboring, uh, building uh, with precious things. Lord, we're thankful that you will burn away the wood, hay, stubble of the wasted time, uh, wrong-minded efforts, uh, tainted works that we do. We're so thankful as well that you will reward those things that you, by your Holy Spirit, produce, which last forever, which withstand the scrutiny of the fiery judgment of Christ our Savior, who will dispense with all the worthlessness and will reward the great things that you do through us. We pray, O oh God, to have lives yielded at your disposal, useful to you, uh, untainted, unhindered, unencumbered. Uh, Lord, we pray to live whatever moments, whatever days you give us on this earth for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning in Equipping Hour, we come to Aging Part 2. A number of weeks ago, we spent some time thinking about getting older, and this morning we'll continue with that with a couple of subtopics that we just uh, ran out of time for at the end. And I, and I intended these two areas to be footnotes on a conversation about aging, uh, but we're going to spend a little more time on them this morning, specifically middle aging and cognitive decline. But really, in, in looking into both of these topics, I'm, I'm merely going to suggest to you that, that we're talking about tips of icebergs here. Uh, there is much more to dig into, and, and I will just assign you the homework. Uh, grow old, grow old well, grow old in the grace of God. Uh, might recommend a couple of books and a couple of resources. There's a wonderful intersection happening in, in some of these equipping hours and um, a, a dear, mature, seasoned geezer just came up to me this morning. And you know who you are. And said, I've just been spending so much time expressing gratitude to God for things, I've run out of time to complain. And what a wonderful testimony of the grace of God in a life doing these things well. So I just want to commend to you that, that growing old doesn't have to be bad if we are growing old in the grace of God. So this morning we enter into part two, uh, really an introduction to the rest of your life uh, of, of aging, growing old in the grace of God. Korean War ace and test pilot John Glenn became the first human to orbit the earth he went up in a spacecraft as an astronaut, and he literally sat on top of humanity's greatest technological advances. And John Glenn said, there is still no cure for the common birthday. That's a helpful reminder that growing old is inevitable. It is something we are all to face. And, and the critical thing for us is to face it well. To, to grow old well, to, to grow old under the banner of the reign of grace, the gospel and its effects in our lives. And so, uh, if you don't think you're old, don't tune out. Uh, if, if you think you're old and you're not, I hope to have a bit of a recalibration. For all of us, I hope that we see all the life that God gives us, however short or long it may be, and we don't know, as a stewardship. Let's talk first about middle aging, middle aging. There's a book to pick up at some point in your life, a book you need to read. It's Paul David Tripp, and the title is Lost in the Middle. Subtitle is Midlife and the Grace of God. Uh, this is a helpful read. Uh, I, I read it a few weeks ago, anticipating someday when I arrive at middle age. And I think a couple of weeks ago, I, I shared with you that my wife has already turned 50, and I'm still a long ways off of that, a couple of months. Paul Tripp in that book says, midlife is a time of harvest. 
The leaves are off the trees and there is no putting them back. The world won't reverse on its axis. Clocks won't turn back. If childhood is the spring of one's life and youth is the summer, then middle age is the autumn. It is the time when each of us, in very important ways, reaps what he sows. When you've spent your whole life planting, it seems weird and unnatural to harvest, but you have no choice. The midlife crisis is a real thing. It's a phenomenon. It's got a label in our culture built on the experiences of of many people who have experienced it. Wrapped up in this idea of a midlife crisis are things like nostalgia, thinking about the good old days, resentment, looking back and seeing failures, living your life in the rearview mirror. Maybe you look around and and you see younger people than you accomplishing more than you did, or accomplishing the things you thought you would, or accomplishing the things you wish you had. You see wasted time in the rearview mirror, squandered opportunities, broken relationships. When you look forward, you feel trapped by limitations. You no longer have the opportunities that youth afforded. You no longer have the the promises that youth gave. You feel trapped by the limitations of time, limitations of money, limitations of health. I remember teaching budgeting and finance and saving and investment to high schoolers when I was 27 years old. And I remember taking some of the statistics from Dave Ramsey. If you will just put away $200 a month and let it sit in any kind of investment with a sort of a broad, variable, various portfolio of investments, you will be a millionaire by the time you're da 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 da. And I laid out all these charts and all these plans and all these designs. And I talked about how important it was to contribute to your IRAs and and to do all these things that would be wise and responsible stewardship. And I can tell you that I'm almost 50 years old and I haven't put $200 away every month to do that. What can be done in the future? The exponential growth of compound interest is no longer available to me in the way that it was when I was 18 years old. You may be feeling that. You may be experiencing the limitations of health. No longer able to do the things that you used to do. No longer able to do the things that that you had hoped to do. And it takes longer to recover from injuries and from workouts. Maybe you feel a need to escape those regrets to make some last gasp effort at reliving youth, at recapturing a physical prime of having money to spend on previously unfulfilled wishes. Maybe you've got resources now that you didn't have when you were 18 and you can get that sports car that you always wished that you'd had. And you've got resources to do it. Or maybe you don't have the resources to do it, but you're willing to go into debt to get it because you always wanted it. Many in a midlife crisis will leave the wife of his youth or the husband of her covenant promise. And what creeps into life is a boredom with the mundane combined with the regrets of missed opportunities in the past, unfulfilled dreams, unfulfilled desires. And what's really happening in a midlife crisis is the exposure of idolatries. When there is restlessness and regrets, what, it, what is bubbling to the surface is all those things I wish I had but don't. And, and the question for one in midlife, the question for one tempted in, in sort of a midlife crisis, if we borrow the world's label for this, the, the appropriate question to ask is, what do I treasure Where is my treasure? When we talked about aging a few weeks ago, we we looked at Colossians 3 and contemplated, where is my identity? And if you're a Christian, your identity is in Christ. 
Your life is hid with him in heaven, and you will see who you really are when he returns, and you are revealed. But the corollary to the question, who am I, is the question, what do I love? Because in great measure, here and now, you are defined by your loves. You will be like what you worship. And so disappointments and regrets in midlife can expose your heart's treasures. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 12, 34. For where your treasure is, that's your heart. It's who you are. That's the inner man. What have you set your affections on? What have you pointed your investments toward? What do you labor for? What do you sin to get? Or what, are, what, do, you, what, what do you sin for in the regret of not getting? That is the exposure of your idols. And a midlife crisis is a crisis of idolatry. If the Lord allows you to go through midlife, you don't have to have a crisis about it. If you're feeling these things, just know that those are the things you love more than you love God bubbling to the surface. And see this as an opportunity to put those things to death, to mortify them, to observe what they are, to root them out, to see the faulty loves, alternate loves that underlie them, and to kill them, to replace them, to rekindle your affection for God, have Christ have first place in your heart, to go back to your first love. Take the opportunity to evaluate your disappointments. What did you not get out of life that you wanted? Is it a misplaced treasure? Career achievements, athletic prowess, financial security, marriage, children, grandchildren, maybe great and grand and glorious ministry attainments. Listen, there can be many good things to desire in life. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from Yahweh. Marriage is good. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. That's a good thing. Grandchildren are a heritage. Those are good things. But what if you don't have those good things? Being a a missionary in some far off place and accomplishing great and grand and glorious things for God where everybody comes to Christ in some tribe. That's a wonderful thing, a thing you should pray for and long for. What if you hope for those things and don't attain them? We have to be careful that even good things, very good things, make their way on the list of idols. Maybe goals that we had for our life, but in God's providence are not what He had for our life. Are you content with God's sovereign providence. Listen, it's okay to look back and lament your own failures, but I would suggest that you can't, you shouldn't do that too much. We looked at Paul's words in Philippians, leaving behind what is behind and pressing forward to the upward call. In the providence of God, you are where you are right now. In the providence of God, you are who you are right now. In the providence of God, the days before you are the days that God has for you. All of this is a stewardship. All of this is an opportunity. And you need to live right here, right now. What will you do with this life that God has graciously given to you? It's a gift. Who you are right now, the days ahead of you are a gift from the Lord. When you think about talents, our English word talent comes from the denomination of coinage called a talent, a wage. You ever think about that? It comes, actually, our English use of the word talent, meaning, hey, I have these abilities to do things that I'm really good at, actually comes from the parable in the Bible about the dispensing of wages as an investment. Uh, Here's a a monetary unit given by a master to his slaves. What will they do with that? Fritter it away on worthless stuff? 
Invest it wisely so that the master has more on his return or hide it away out of fear. How are the slaves praised in the parable? Not that they just kept what was the master's to give it back to him at the same amount. Certainly no one is praised for squandering it on worthless things. But the servants are praised who took those talents and invested them for greater return for the master's sake. And the, the great twist in the parable is those slaves who deserve nothing, who were given things freely by the master, get rewarded for the things they've done with the things that were his. So you sit here right now, what will you do with your life? Those talents, those investments from your master. That is the midlife situation. That is the midlife responsibility. Your life's not over until God says it is. And so don't let wanderlust and restlessness take you away from really good opportunities right in front of you to glorify the Lord, to be a wise steward of gifts, resources, time, opportunities, and relationships. That's your task. That is the, the privilege of midlife. I'm going to read the parable from Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. You can turn there in your Bibles. I want you to see this. We're going to look at two contrasting ideas of the reward for living for the glory of God. And these contrasting ideas are not at odds with one another. They actually hold hands in our Bibles. They go together. They portray two different facets. Listen to Matthew 20. Follow along in your Bibles. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came... They thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only an hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. If you've been listening to me so far this morning and you're thinking, oh, Smed's talking about midlife, and that was like decades ago for me. <laughs> Take comfort in this parable. If you're an 11th hour laborer for the glory of God, guess what? Denarius, undeserved, generous, a gift. Think about the thief on the cross, a life squandered and an 11th hour repentance. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, the guy goes from insurrectionist, thief, perhaps murderer, lowest of the low class, worthy of a Roman execution. Public shame, public humiliation, and he knows he's getting what he deserves. And in his last moments, discovers the Savior who calls him home. Reward. Denarius. Enter into your rest. What am I doing here? And what should the first hour laborers also say about a denarius? Undeserved. Can't believe I got hired. What am I doing here? We're tempted to not to. 
should all be gratitude. So that's one side of the equation. A denarius for everybody <laughs> that believes. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3. You can turn there. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 to 10. This is one of many passages that talks about rewards in the Bible that are not all the same. And you can look up on the Equipping Hour resources. I did a series on rewards for service in life. You can listen to that in full. I won't redo all of that here. But listen to the words from Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 8. Each will receive his own reward according to his labor. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul says, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. That's the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in the church age. And another is building on it. Paul is handing the torch, handing the baton, not to another generation of apostles, the first generation of, of those who were New Testament prophets are not passing on the baton of prophecy. They're passing on the labor of building, not the foundation, but the successive floors of this building God is building, which is the people of God, the church in this age. And notice the injunction, each man must be careful how he builds on it. There Paul is talking to you and to me as Christians in the 21st century. We're 21 floors up from the foundation, and you need to be careful how you build. What is the consequence of good building in this passage? You build with precious things, God rewards. Uh, you insert worthless stuff, not doing God's business God's way, lame motives, wasted time, wrong priorities, selfishness, self-aggrandizement. You, you can be working on the building and doing it all the wrong ways. What does God say? All of that burns up like wood, hay, and stubble. That doesn't get to go into heaven. And praise God, that stuff doesn't go into heaven. Who wants to be up there with that stuff? I think we'll say thank you at the Bema seat of rewards. That judgment seat where Christ, with his fiery scrutiny, gets rid of all the stuff that doesn't belong there. We'll say thank you. And I think we'll say thank you in a bigger way when God rewards service that he himself produced by his Holy Spirit. Listen, everybody gets a denarius. The denarius in the Matthew 20 parable is eternal life. Nobody gets more or less of eternal life. But the biblical doctrine of rewards means a greater capacity of fruitfulness and enjoyment of service to God in eternity. And you invest well here, make him in charge of five, make him in charge of 10. Hundreds folds. Those who are rewarded for faithfulness in this life will also say thank you to God, not just for burning away the dross, but for rewarding the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a yielded believer. And we ought to say something like this. God, thank you. Why are you rewarding me for the things that only you could produce? And our generous God will be discovered to be the one who just gives and gives and gives and gives. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He will be debtor to no one and he will reward only what he produces. And so Christian, yield your life to him. Be fruitful in the things the Spirit would do through you as a stewardship. And I'll say it again. If you could see now what the rewards would be, I'm convinced you'd be sleepless. Go back and hear Jake's, Jake Hantla's uh, equipping hour on sleep. You need sleep in this life. But I believe we would be so motivated by the reward that we would labor and labor and labor for eternal things. These two ideas, one equal reward for everybody in Christ and a variation in rewards based on faithful yielded service to Christ go together in our Bibles. And you need to know both of them. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And John MacArthur said, fervency springs from a vision of heaven's reward. Fervency springs from a vision of heaven's reward. 
put it in your mind. If you're pre-midlife, midlife, post-midlife, wherever you're at in life, your outer man is decaying to one degree or another, inner man being renewed day by day, age well in the grace of God, have an eternal perspective, and live for Him. It's worth it. If you're caught in the middle, lost in the middle, as Paul Tripp says, distracted, restless, just take the opportunity to look at the idols that produce it. Put them to death and enjoy life. Let's move to the second half of our time this morning. Let's talk about cognitive decline. This is just another addendum to our discussion about aging. And you need to know up front, I'm not an expert on cognitive decline. And you might say, Smed, look, we've been wanting to talk to you. You actually are an expert on cognitive decline and you're not admitting it. Great. Tell me that. That's great. Uh, you who, whose names I have forgotten, who are close friends of mine, you, you're going to say, no, 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 Smed's an expert. The reality is we all face cognitive decline. But the kind of cognitive decline I want to focus on here, it, it will have application to all of us. Um, but, but there is a, a, a darker side of the fall, a more difficult side of the fall that's worth spending some, some time thinking about. And, and it is dementia. Dementia is the symptom of a, a number of various physiological disorders that accelerate cognitive decline. Dementia is the, the, the primary physiological consequence of Alzheimer's. And I'm not an expert on these things. Uh, I have had some ministry to people with dementia, which as a, a, a very young preacher had some advantages. I just mean I could use the same illustrations and the same jokes and even the same passages, and it felt fresh and new to some people in the audience. And yet, the, the compassion that is evoked from watching people who lived life, full lives, and don't even have the memories of the things that they have done. They don't even have that left. Produces a sympathy and, and a longing to care. And it ought to produce fuel for us to love the elderly, love those who decline mentally, maybe even earlier than expected, uh, by disease or by injury. In a few weeks, I don't, actually, I don't know when it is, sometime in the somewhat near future, Jacob Handler is planning to do a two-part equipping hour on dementia. And he's going to address more the medical side, the physiological side of experiencing dementia and caring for those who experience dementia. And Jake will actually spend some time talking about some of the, the gadgets and exercises that all of us can do to ward off mental decline before it needs to happen. So that will be really helpful. That will be really practical. I'm not going to try to step on those toes here. I have some things I want us to think about. As future sufferers and caregivers, um, but less technical um, than, than what Jake will do. The number one medical fear for Americans today in our day is cancer. And the number two medical fear for Americans today is Alzheimer's disease. It, it is prevalent. Studies have shown that the amount of diagnosed Alzheimer's disease will triple in the next decade. The reality is most of us will experience cognitive decline. It's part of the dying process. It's part of the process of the outer man wasting away. Memory fails us, just like our muscles fail us and our joints fail us. And particularly short-term memory tends to fade. But dementia is, and I'll give more of a, a definitional description here, dementia is an irreversible and serious decline in cognitive performance more than would be expected given the age or circumstances of the person. Dementia is progressive, 
that is irreversible as far as we're able at the moment. Uh, It is a progressive loss of brain cells in critical portions of the brain related to a number of functions, but most obviously at the front end to memory. And we all forget things, but outside of dementia, we're we're aware that we're forgetting things. There's sort of a blank space in the information we can't come up with. If I'm shaking your hand on a Sunday morning and I, I can't quite place your name or, or I get the name wrong, I, I'm aware that you have a name. I'm aware that I'm forgetting the name. I'm aware that I'm forgetting your name. I'm aware that I know you and can't quite come up with it. There's a space there. But with dementia, one of the increasing realities is the unawareness that there's a space And so the brain is forced to scramble, filling in the blanks. I don't know this person's name. I don't know this person. I've never been around this person, though I've been married to her for 40 years. And so the brain goes through strange, convoluted thoughts that in its own world are completely and totally rational. But to those who have loved the dementia patient or friend or spouse seem irrational. This is a tough thing to go through. With dementia, you lose the cognizance of the space where the information was supposed to be. You don't realize you have forgotten. That produces disorientation, confusion, fear, isolation, loneliness. I have an outline for you on cognitive decline, and I'll just give you sort of the categories we'll go through this morning. Uh, Let's put all five of them up there, or six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, there are five of them. Um, See, I forgot. Just, And then we'll walk through these one by one. I just want you to know sort of the roadmap for, for what we'll talk about this morning. First, let's talk about God's purposes in a decline like this. Uh, I have assembled these from various sources. But one of God's purposes in dementia is to humble the proud. Do you remember the scene in Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar in his pride, he's walking on the roof of his house and he says, look what I did. Babylon the great, I did this. And God says, no, you didn't. I'm going to humble you. Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar went into the field like a cow and ate grass for years. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's affliction was reversed by God, and he had the ability to look back on that period and tell us what it was like and have a different perspective. That's not the case for the progressive decline of cognitive abilities in dementia. But a very real facet of what God is doing in all of our physical decline, this is universal. By the way, the God humbling the proud is not a one-to-one correspondence of everybody with dementia was inordinately proud, like a Nebuchadnezzar walking on his roof saying, I built this. No, this is the result of the fall of man. And cognitive decline inevitably humbles everybody who suffers under it just as the physical decline humbles everybody who suffers under it. Listen, if you were Michael Jordan, inarguably the greatest of all time basketball player, and can't do what you used to do. It's lamentable, it's sad. Don't don't you imagine that Michael Jordan wishes he were still at the top of his game? still at the top of his physicality. And and athletes typically think along this line, I wish I had my 19-year-old energy, my 23-year-old frame, and my 58-year-old brains. I would have been the best. (laughs) And if you compete against everybody at their maximum prime in all those areas, you wouldn't be the best. You'd you'd still just be you. (laughs) There's not a one-to-one correspondence between pride and senility or pride and dementia or pride and Alzheimer's. Uh, The question, who sinned this man or his parents, 
is a, is a confused question about a straight line between sufferers and specific sins. Nevertheless, even the godliest and humblest among us will be humbled further by the decline of our mental state. One of God's purposes is to humble the proud. I read a number of stories over the last few weeks of people who in their mental decline, in their diagnosed dementia, during moments of relative lucidity, heard the gospel and got saved. Aware of the loss of the faculties they had taken pride in was a pathway to the gospel and to eternal life and a rescue from God. There's a second purpose we might mention, and it is to increase our dependence. Turn to 2 Corinthians, uh, no, 2 Chronicles. Sixteen. In verses 12 and 13, we have this description of the end of Asa's life. Asa was one of the kings of Judah. We read, Asa became diseased in his feet in the 39th year of his reign. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease, he did not seek Yahweh, but the physicians. He slept with his fathers. He died. They buried him. Did they write that on his gravestone? He didn't seek Yahweh. He only went after the best the medical world in his day had to offer. What might the Lord do in cognitive decline for you? Point you to himself. Increase your dependence upon him. Make you pray. God, help me. My brain's not working the way it used to. That would please the Lord. God might do that in your life. Another purpose is that we would learn to fight harder for sanctification for growth in Christ. The sanctification process isn't merely at the subconscious level. It's not merely automatic. We'll talk about this more in a few moments. But just as physical abilities decline, some things were easier for you in your prime and in your youth, so also mental abilities. Things just get harder. So work harder. Learn to fight harder. Sure, you'll wish you had fought harder when it was easier. So what? Fight harder now. John Piper said in an article on dementia, disability demands greater effort. Disability demands greater effort. That's true. What do you do with that? Help, Lord. I want to fight. I want to take up the the, the Romans 6, 12, and 13 injunction every day. That's where God says in your fight with sin, take all of your members, all of your faculties, Your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your brain, your affections. And take them as weapons of warfare. Not into the hall of the slavery and tyranny of sin where you used to be a slave headed towards death. But into the very hallway of your new master, the God of grace who loves you and gave himself up for you. And offer these implements, including your brain as a weapon of warfare to accomplish good things for his glory. Enter the fight, learn to fight harder when it's harder to do so. Here's another purpose in God's heart that applies, I think, to dementia, and it is the sanctification of caregivers. The sanctification of caregivers. If you've done this, you know Getting married is, is one of the really sanctifying events in life. Um, I've had it really easy. But what confronts every individual when you get married is the radical death to self that marriage requires. 
God does it again to you when you have kids. It's another humbling experience because you can't live for yourself when you have little ones. Uh, Your life is absorbed in caring for the needs of someone else who happens to be very demanding and doesn't know anything. (laughs) And if you've cared for a loved one closely in cognitive decline, you experience another level of selflessness, of love, of fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. One of God's purposes for caregivers is to make them more like Christ, to let love come to fruition, to flower into its beauty. Embrace that as a caregiver. If you've watched people care for loved ones in decline, maybe you've seen it. A kind of love that the rest of us who haven't been there can't quite grapple with. You, wait, wait, wait a minute. You, you introduced yourself to him as his wife again? You loved him selflessly again? When he didn't recognize you? You took care of physical needs You took the repeated blows of of all the forgotten memories. You have the photographs, and they're asking, who's that? Hey, when did so-and-so go to Italy? (laughs) Got to watch my daughter and my wife care for Jean over the last couple of years. And and they got to meet Jean at the end of her life. Uh, Evie got to know her with a little bit more mental faculty, and then... My wife picked up where Evie left off in a greater decline. And she lived a storied life, a full life, lots of adventures, a brilliant woman, loved by her family. And as God took away memory for her, he took it away from the back end. So the most recent things went away first and worked their way backwards so that She didn't recognize the husband in the photos. And she didn't recognize her own daughter who came and cared for her from another state over and over and over again. She had memories from her childhood. She could speak with clarity about a a boy she knew in elementary school. And, And talk about all of those to her daughter whom she did not know takes love to give care. It takes patience and kindness. And there's much to be learned from those who have done it. If, if you're moving into that territory, get a disciple or put your life under someone who's done it well. I can recommend some blogs to you from a friend who's done it very well. Let me move on to some theological reminders Second point in our outline. Cognitive decline can't change one's standing with God. Turn to 1 Peter. In cognitive decline, memories go away. The things that make personality traits come out into the open, they begin to be chipped away. One of the great pains for caregiving loved ones is to watch those personality traits that you've loved just fall off the scene one by one by one. Piece by piece, the person I knew is departing. It is a a long, slow grief. Listen to 1 Peter. Again, as as we're turning there, I'm, I'm thinking again of Colossians 3 and what is your life? It's hidden with Christ in God. It will be revealed when he comes. In 1 Peter 3, sorry, 1 Peter 1, excuse me, verse 3. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
unto an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, unfading, having been kept in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That is a tremendous comfort for us as caregivers of our loved ones experience decline. Cognitive decline can't change your standing with God. Born again unto an inheritance. Memories may fade, but that inheritance can never. Cognitive decline can potentially reveal a standing with God. Cognitive decline, which removes social inhibitions and removes the, the cloaking of sort of outside external controls... Cognitive decline can reveal the heart. It can pull back the curtain on a deception. It can reveal truths deeply embedded in the subconscious. It can melt away the pretender. Again, I read a, a stories of a number of people who had an outside appearance of sort of cultural Christianity who under cognitive decline kind of exposed who they really were. Gospel came and was believed, a new life, or maybe not believed. Cognitive decline cannot change your standing with God, but it might reveal it. Another theological truth, there is no separation. You know Romans 8, 38 to 39. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death, nor life, not angels, and you can add to the list, not cognitive decline. Cognitive decline does not change the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Romans 8, 26 and 27. The Holy Spirit inside the believer groans with deep groans beyond our words. The Holy Spirit interprets prayers on the way up according to the will of the Father. That doesn't change. Hebrews 13, 5 is true. God will not leave us or forsake us, even when our mental abilities might leave us and forsake us. Isaiah 46, 4, turn there. Another theological truth that we need. Even to your old age, God says, I will be the same even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will rescue you. It's a wonderful promise. And you can remember that God remembers. Don't forget that God doesn't forget his people. Genesis 8.1. God remembered Noah. God remembered Lot. God remembered Moses. God remembered his people's groanings, book of Judges. Over and over and over again, God remembers his people. Our failing memories go the other way. God does not forget. Let's talk about anticipating and experiencing dimension for a few moments. Let me just highlight some high-level principles. Number one, don't fear the decline. Don't fear it. In one sense, it's very normal. In one sense, it's expected. Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 4, the, the outer man wastes away, the inner man being renewed day by day. The, the mind is part of that wasting away. Elizabeth Elliot, the, the, the wife of Jim Elliot, the missionary martyr, said, many deaths must go into reaching our maturity in Christ. Many letting goes. And she said that at the front end of her own cognitive decline. And in an interview with her, in her presence, when, when her mental faculties were mostly gone, the one who had been caring for her said she accepted these things, dementia and, and other consequences, knowing that they were no surprise to God. And when that sentence was said out loud in her presence, she said yes out loud and nodded. Don't fear the decline. 
Don't fear losing God in the decline. And another principle for us to take away is to engage in spiritual disciplines now. With dementia, filters break down, sensors break down, your self-control and your inhibitions break down. The ability to resist intrusive thoughts breaks down. Therefore, work now to put patterns in place that you want to govern you when you can't employ sophisticated covering techniques. Just work on your heart now. What, who do you want to be when you have Alzheimer's? That's the question. In 1 Timothy 1.5, Paul talked about a sincere faith, a, a faith without cracks, a, a faith that was the same on the inside and the outside. Memorize Scripture. Fight sanctification at every stage of life. Fight for sanctification. Don't fight against it. That would have been an error. Fight for sanctification at every stage. There are some ways to outsmart a failing memory. Tuck this away. Smartphone alarms with scripture, songs, and truths that you'll need that buzz and go off and give you that verse you couldn't memorize that you knew you would need throughout the day. You can outsmart your mental decline with technology. And, and if you didn't have smartphones, then post-it notes. Some way to remind yourself of the things you won't be able to remember. Particularly the front stages when, when you begin to be aware that the memory is going away. Um, beat it technology, technologically. Another principle for us to think about is leaning on the body of Christ. Have a friend who knows how and when to read and speak truths that you will need when you forget them. And here the, the metaphor of the body of Christ becomes less metaphorical and very real, very literal. Um, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you, or vice versa. No, I, actually, my eyes are failing me. I can't see to read anymore. Will you read to me? I have a friend just recently who came back to the States to care for his uh, declining father after the death of his mother. And, and he went to his house and, and, and technologically built this massive screen, went and, and bought the biggest TV he could get and connected it to the phone so that the texts come out like skywriting in the living room so that the man could read encouraging things, biblical truth and theology. This, this was a man who spent his life as a missionary and in his decline still wanted to have access to God's word. You can use technology and friends in the body of Christ to be ears and eyes and, and even frontal lobes for you. I can't remember stuff, but you can. Will, will, you, will you help me? Will you be my memory for me? And learn to boast in your weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. There are things we'd love to have removed. Paul wanted to have something removed. He prayed about it. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? Power is made manifest. God's power is made manifest in human weakness. Our decline is God's opportunity. Just embrace that. Let's talk about caring for a loved one with dementia. You need to worship God through sacrificial kindness. You might have to be the brand new caregiver every day for years, reintroducing yourself to someone you've loved for a lifetime. It's often a long decline. The memory goes first, other mental functions come later. And in one sense, it's a prolonged loss, piece by piece of a loved one. Memory by memory, personality trait by personality trait. You're gonna have to worship God in sacrificial kindness. Secondly, be generous in your assumptions. The filters and the sensors break down. Self-control and inhibitions break down. Every believer still has the residue of total depravity affecting every capacity of the human constitution. Things may come out from the lips of a believer who exercised self-control over intrusive thoughts all her life. Remember we were, a few weeks ago we were talking about Christian OCD. 
And, and, and it, it's a, a, a regular phenomenon that, that godly people in terror obsess over the thought that they might stand up in church and, and utter the, the worst profanities at the preacher. No, they've never done it, but they've thought it. Have I sinned? Am I tempted? I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's a godly heart that fears such things. Could an intrusive thought come out <laughs> from the lips of a, a very godly, sweet prayer warrior lady at the end of her life with no more inhibitions? Sure. Let it roll off like water off a duck's back. <laughs> Just expect things like that. Be generous in your assumptions. Have a category for someone who fought intentionally to be patient who is now impatient, who fought a hard fight over anger, who now expresses anger. Just be generous with those things. Listen, to, at the front end, before you decline, work on your own heart so that you're not angry. <laughs> and with someone who's expressing anger, be, be generous and patient. Next, be patient with irrational behavior. What seems like irrational behavior to us is the brain's way of making sense out of missing information. Someone who is afraid of snakes, who, who has a, a belief that there are snakes in his bed, is not going to jump into bed. It's irrational. You need to sleep. But it's not irrational if someone believes there are snakes in the bed. <laughs> Just put your feet in their shoes. Walk a mile with those who are trying to make sense out of a world that doesn't make sense anymore. And then be patient with the fading memories, fading personality traits. A friend of mine said of her husband, he looks right at me occasionally, but I can't tell if he knows me. After decades of marriage. She described the effects of Alzheimer's as a devastating illness that separates loved ones with an invisible wall. Listen, forgetting who you are does not mean you were not loved. It's hard. For all of us, a couple things to think forward about. Consider your current faculties, abilities, opportunities, relationships. They are stewardships easily squandered. Age does not automatically produce Christ likeness, godliness, gentleness, goodness, love, patience. You cannot coast on prior spiritual victories. If you coast, you fall apart spiritually. Don't coast, mash down the accelerator, drop a gear, and get sanctified. <laughs> Pursue holiness. Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So work on your heart now. Cultivate a sincere faith. One pastor wrote this, if I were to develop Alzheimer's disease, I would want to look like, and he described a, a humble, faithful pastor who experienced mental decline, and in his mental decline, served others. Listen, I watched my own granddaddy do this. He, he was lucid near the end of his life, alone after his beloved wife had gone to be with the Lord. Uh, he was alone in a, a retirement home. And his brain worked every couple of weeks. And when it worked, he'd write a sermon and he'd go share it with the people that he lived with. He even called me on the phone. I was a few years out of seminary. And he said, Grandson, this, um, this expository preaching, is that what you do? He was reading MacArthur's Rediscovering Expository Preaching. And I said, oh, granddaddy, it, it's what I try. <laughs> and he said, I think that's what I'm going to start trying. <laughs> and he, when he had his, his mind working a little bit, he would put thoughts together and open a passage and teach it to his friends in the home. This author was describing a similar pastor. And he said, if, when I get Alzheimer's, I, I want to look like that. I, I want to have those practices in my life to hold on to. But then I thought, he writes, I won't have those disciplines in Alzheimer's disease if I don't have them right now. And so it encouraged me to be thinking about what rhythms of faith I want to have in my life right now. What spiritual disciplines are regular enough for me that they will stick even when I'm deep into forgetting. 
I'll leave you with one last contemplation this morning. Right now you have stuff, you have experiences. You will be left with souvenirs and memories. Your souvenirs will end up in the yard sale and your memories will dim and fade. Do you have Christ? Let's pray. Lord, the outer man is wasting away. We trust you in your process to renew the inner man. We yield ourselves to that process in faith and obedience. Help us. Help us, O oh Lord. Oh, how we long to be home. Speed us there for your glory in Jesus' name.